This is not my work. It's based largely on the work of Gary Potter, a huge number of quotes and paraphrases from other authors, far too many to mention in a sermon. After gaining her independence in 1821, Mexico was governed by a series of rulers increasingly hostile to Catholicism, although through it all Mexican people remained relatively steadfast in their faith. But during the revolution, and starting with the rule of the White House-backed Carranza, the faithfulness of the people began to be tested as never before. On Thursday, April 29, 1920, the United States Senate Subcommittee on Foreign Relations heard testimony from two witnesses about troubles in the Carranza-controlled areas of Mexico. Mother Maria Elias del Santissimo Sacramento, she's a discalced Carmelite Mother Superior, a nun who had recently fled to the United States, and Father Francis P. Joyce, a captain in the U.S. Army, a chaplain, who had landed at Veracruz in 1914 and also accompanied the Pershing expedition of 1916 and 17. Mother Maria Elias, this is greatly edited uh, for reasons that will be obvious. The Catholic Church is attacked by the revolutionaries. They have closed the churches and prohibited the sacraments to the extent of shooting the priest who dares to hear confession or to administer the sacraments. The confessionals and some images of the saints have been burnt in the public squares to the accompaniment of bands of music and impious speeches. They have profaned the churches, entering them on horseback, smashing the images, treading the relics underfoot, throwing the hosts about the floor, and even giving them to the horses to eat with the fodder. In some churches, the, the Caranzistas themselves have pretended to say Mass and have seated themselves to hear the confessions of a multitude of people. Dressed as priests, they have heard the confessions of sick people, and then in derision they have revealed what they hear in the confession. All this I have seen with my own eyes. All the communities of nuns have been expelled from the entire republic, being given but a half hour to leave, and not allowed to take with them a change of clothes, and in many cases not even a breviary to pray. Many sisters have been taken to the barracks. Immorality has increased to such a degree that they have profaned not only virgins but have violated nuns, carrying them away by force where they now suffer horribly. To the great suffering of my soul, I have seen in Mexico the sad and lamentable fate of many sisters who have been the victims of the unbridled passions of the soldiers. Father Joyce's testimony followed that of Mother Mary Elias. Senate questioner. Were you chaplain in the army with the American troops when they landed at Veracruz in 1914? Father Joyce. Yes, sir. Question. Will you please relate what you learned at that time about the treatment accorded the priests, nuns, and sisters in Mexico by the Carranza Army? Father Joyce. Sir, at Veracruz during the summer of 1914, there were between 600 and 700 sisters, refugees, some clothed in the habit of religious orders, others in various disguises. Besides the sisters, there were many priests who were refugees also, waiting upon tables at restaurants, working on the docks, all trying to earn enough money to get out of the country. There were also seven bishops and archbishops in Veracruz at the time. Many of these women had been outraged in church persecutions initiated by Carranza and Pancho Villa. During this time, I called on Mr. Suleiman, the personal representative of President Wilson to Carranza. I asked that he obtain a boat to ship these people out of the country. He said, on what grounds? I said to him, if not on the grounds of religion, at least on the grounds of humanity. These are women. The priests or men will have to make shift for themselves. Suleiman then stood up and said, it is generally admitted by everybody that the worst thing in Mexico, next to loose women, is the Catholic Church, and both must go. To prevent a fight, I was hustled out of the council's office and reprimanded in a military way for some words I had with Mr. Silliman. Keep in mind, that's the American representative. The poor regular American soldiers took up collections to ship out as many sisters as possible, but when the Americans evacuated Veracruz, more than 400 of the sisters were left behind. Afterwards, I was told that Carranza and Villa's army tried to have one woman to every four soldiers. 
and that many of these sisters were impressed as camp followers for Karanza's army. Question. What were the accounts given by these refugees as to the desecration of churches and the use of sacred things in churches by the Karanza soldiers? Father Joyce. The Karanza at his banquet board supplied each guest with a chalice for wine cup. That vestments were used as saddle blankets. That the churches were used for dance halls and barracks. That statues were taken down from their high places and nude women put there. The tabernacles were shot open and the sacred house trampled upon, and that the furnishings of gold and silver and jewelry were stolen, that men were shot for no other reason than they were Catholics. That mysterious hatred that crucified Christ, that persecuted the martyrs in the arena, that same hatred followed and still follows the Catholic Church in Mexico. Close quotes. Churches used as dance halls, Chalices used as wine cups. Vestments used as saddle blankets. Tabernacles shot open. The host trampled their foot or put in the oats for the horses. Nuns forced to become camp followers. That mysterious hatred that crucified Christ, that persecuted the martyrs in the arena, that same hatred follows and still follows the Catholic Church in Mexico. The Mexican revolutionaries had adopted the principles of the French Revolution. Carranza upped the ante in 1917 when he promulgated a new constitution, which, following French revolutionary principles, was designed to effectively eliminate the church. Henceforth, all elementary education, public or private, had to be secular. Monastic vows, monastic orders were outlawed. Any religious event whatsoever, like a procession outside a church, outlawed. All churches and church-owned property, convents, hospitals, orphanages, were declared to be property of the state. But the worst feature of the 1917 Constitution was Article 130, which stated, among other things, that the federal government had the authority to intervene in matters of religious worship. It forbade any religious publications from any comments on any public affairs whatsoever. It stated that the clergy were subject to civil regulation and that state legislatures had the power to determine the exact number of clergy allowed to function in their states. And sadly, all this was promulgated by a leader who had the support of the United States government. As if they were not bad enough, in 1924, matters took a turn for the worst, when Plutarco Callas became president. Callas was a 33rd degree Mason who was absolutely determined to completely drive the Catholic Church out of Mexico. Soon after taking power, Callas, having recruited some renegade priests, founded a schismatic church and proclaimed one of the renegades, quote, the patriarch of the Mexican Catholic Church, close quote. The idea did not catch on with faithful Catholics. In 1926, Caius made it clear that the federal government would enforce the 1917 Constitution to the rule, and then published a decree called the Caius Act. Among other things, the Caius Act mandated uniform enforcement throughout all Mexico of all of the Constitution's anti-Catholic regulations. It added things like all convents and Catholic schools were to be closed, wearing clerical garb in public was a crime with a 500 peso fine at that time, about $250. It also specified penalties for officials and private citizens who failed to enforce the law. Some of the state governments immediately took advantage of the situation to limit the number of priests. Chihuahua enacted a law that permitted exactly one priest to take care of all the Catholics in their state. Tabasco, six priests were to be allowed, as long as they got married first. From the point of view of the bishop, the most troubling aspect of the situation was that only after, after only one year after this attempted schismatic church promoted by the government, the Caius Act stated that no priest could function. He couldn't say mass or do any other priestly act without having previously registered with the federal, regional, and municipal authorities. This act was due to take effect on July 31st. 
While the bishops were struggling to come up with a response to these outrageous demands, the Apostolic Nuncio to Mexico protested and was expelled from the country on May 12th. Later that month, on May 28th, the Supreme Commander of the Scottish Rite in Mexico presented Caius with the Masonic Medal of Merit. On July 12th, the Masonic press release announced, quote, International Masonry accepts responsibility for everything that is happening in Mexico and is prepared to mobilize all its forces for the methodical, integral application of the agreed upon program for this country. Close quote. Some months later, the New Age, that's actually the magazine of the Scottish Rite here in the U.S., the New Age stated, quote, The Catholic Church has perverted the Mexican for 400 years. Caius merit is to have delivered them from ignorance and superstition. That is why he can count on our understanding and on North America's support. Close quote. Rome told the bishops, under no condition will we accept the registering of priests. So what were the bishops supposed to do? Simply defy the government and order priests not to register? With Vatican approval, the bishops did something unprecedented in the entire history of the church. They announced that starting on July 31st, all public worship throughout Mexico was suspended. Priests were to be withdrawn from every church in the nation. There would be no masses offered, nor sacraments administered throughout the country, except in private chapels. The reaction was immediate. During the last few days of July, people thronged the churches day and night, going to confession, getting baptized, getting married. In the Cathedral of Mexico City, the Archbishop baptized and confirmed over 3,000 Catholics in one day. Time magazine, in a thoroughly contemptible article, which I'll only, only read part of, reported on Kaya's public response. Kaya's, quote, No influence, national or international, including the grunts of the Pope, will cause the Mexican government to vary its attitude. The government is determined to enforce the laws for the regulation of religious societies of all kinds, even should it be necessary to recur to extreme measures. Catholics will be severely punished if they violate the law. Close quote, Plutarco Caius. On Sunday, August 1st, 1926, for the first time in over 400 years, no priest ascended an altar of any Mexican church for morning mass. In the cities and big towns, a faithful Catholic might find Mass somewhere, usually in a private home, but not in the small towns and villages of the countryside. For the most part, the war began and would be fought in the countryside. On August 3rd, in order to protect their now closed church from being sacked and sacrilegiously treated by the government forces, some 400 armed Catholics shut themselves up in the Church of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Guadalajara, Jalisco. They were involved in a shootout with federal troops and surrendered only when they ran out of ammunition. The following day, there was another outbreak in Michoacan, then in Zacatecas, then in Guanajuato, and then in Durango. There are peasant risings almost everywhere but in the north and except in a few places, the tropical south. The actual war, called the Cristiada, raged mostly in the states in the center and west of the country. Zacatecas, Durango, Guanajuato, Michoacan, Colima, and above all, Jalisco. The Caius government did not take the threat very seriously at first. The commander of the Federales in Jalisco wired to Army headquarters saying that this, quote, will be less a campaign than a hunt, close quote. He was in for a surprise. The Catholics prayed and sang far into the night, singing hymns and ro saying the rosary were an essential part of their daily life on the march and in their camps. Before battle, their commanders urged them to make an act of perfect contrition. They swore before our God to conquer or to die, and they charged the enemy singing psalms and crying out, Viva Cristo Rey! Viva la Virgen de Guadalupe! Long live Christ the King! Long live the Virgin of Guadalupe! Because of this battle cry, the government mockingly named the Catholic warriors the Cristeros, just shorting out Cristo Rey. That's where they got the name. As one Cristero stated, Caia simply had to be fought, quote, because I think it is better to die fighting for Christ the King and the Virgin of Guadalupe and all their family and not take a single step 
against the one true God. Close quote. Before he was killed, another Christo wrote, quote, We are going to perish. We will not see the victory, but Mexico needs all this blood for its purification. Christ will receive the homage which is his due. Close quote. The women of the Cristeros were nothing less than amazing. They formed the St. Joan of Arc brigades who organized along military lines. Each brigade of 650 women was commanded by a colonel who was assisted by a lieutenant colonel and five majors, each having under her captains, lieutenants, and sergeants with five soldiers under each sergeant. The main service they performed was providing ammunition to the fighters. For much of the war, except for what they captured from the enemy, the fighters relied exclusively on the support of the women's brigades. The women were able to operate in complete secrecy, such complete secrecy, that none were arrested until March 1929, after they existed nearly two years. Not a single defection from the grades ranks of 25,000 women is known to have taken place. 25,000 women. At the height, the height of his power, Villa had 20,000 men. At the height of his power, Zapata had 10,000 men. The St. Joan of Arc Brigade had 25,000 women, and most people have never heard of them. The wives and mothers, the Catholic wives who encouraged their husbands to fight, and the Catholic mothers who gave up their sons. As one mother said, I offered the life of my four boys to Christ, but the Lord came up short. He only took two. Compare the piety of the Cristero troops, leadership, and women to the attitude of the federal troops and leadership. There were federal officers who had their troops fall into the cry of, Long live Satan. Long live the devil. The treatment of those who fell into the hands of the Federalists is no less horrific. Quote, no prisoners were taken. Civilians taken as hostages were murdered. Torture was systematic and was used not only to, to obtain information, but also to prolong suffering and to attempt to get Catholics to renounce their faith. To be forced to walk on the flayed soles of the feet. To be flayed, burned, have their bones broken, to be quartered alive, hung up by their thumbs, garroted, electrocuted, scorched by blowtorches, racked, subjected to the torture of the boot and the water torture, stretched out, dragged behind a horse. Such was the fate of those who fell into the hands of the federales. And, of course, there were the sacrileges of the federales. Churches were desecrated by officers who rode into them on horseback, trampled the host under the hooves of their chargers, used the altars as dining tables, and turned the building into a stable. Statues of saints were used for target practice, and those of the Virgin were undressed, and the soldiers danced with them. The soldiers dressed up in ecclesiastical vestments, ate the consecrated hosts, and drank café au lait from chalices. Close quote. Keep in mind that most, if not all these men, were themselves baptized Catholics. Gary Potter assesses the church leadership. There were 38 Mexican bishops at the time of the Christiata. No more than seven ever supported it. Twelve bishops were adamantly opposed to the rebellion. The 19 others did as most bishops always seem to do in every historical situation. They took no firm position. All were ordered deported by President Caius in April 1927. 35 complied with the order. Three remained in the country, two of them in hiding in their own diocese, the third moving around among private homes in the capital. Those in exile sent a message of congratulation to President Portes Gil when he survived the explosion of a bomb in Guanajuato on February 10, 1929. The bishop's position was one that left them technically above the resort to arms, while at the same time they did not simply condemn the rebellion. They could even be said, depending on how the fighting went, to wish it well. And how did the fighting go? By 1929, the Cristeros had been so successful that the government renounced its policy of governing the countryside. Three quarters of inhabitable Mexico was in the hands of the troops of Christ the King, and victory was in reach. There were 50,000 Cristeros in the field at that time. Again, at its peak, Zapata had no more than 10,000 men, Pancho Villa no more than 20,000. Both are known worldwide, but not the Cristeros. 
the total of those who fought for the Cristeros was actually much greater than 50,000 because 100,000 combatants were killed in the war, of which 40,000 were Cristeros. The U.S. ambassador at the time of the Cristiata was an upper-class wasp, the father-in-law of Charles Winberg, Dwight W. Morrow. Morrow could hardly be accused of being an impartial observer. The French historian Jean Meyer explains, quote, the personal friendship that existed between the remarkable ambassador Morrow and President Kayas was accompanied by close political collaboration. Morrow, in his diplomatic capacity, played an essential role in the settlement of a religious conflict. Parenthetically, we'll see what that settlement was in a minute. Morrow, in his diplomatic capacity, played an essential role in the settlement of the religious conflict. And as a financier, he assisted his Mexican colleague. Thanks to his good offices, the Mexican government was able to purchase directly from United States arsenals 10,000 Enfield rifles, 10 million rounds of ammunition, and aircraft which took part in the Battle of Jimenez with American pilots. Close quote. It sounds like current events, doesn't it? This is an American ambassador. Silliman that we heard Father Joyce's uh, report was, was also an American ambassador. Parenthetically, it, it helps faithful Catholics understand that old Mexican proverb that says, poor Mexico, so far from God and so near to the United States. As if that weren't clear enough, in a May 1929 memo sent to the U.S. State Department, Ambassador Morrow stated, quote, it is the general opinion among the better class of Mexicans that unless the Mexican government is able to exterminate the marauding bands of Cristeros which infest the surrounding country or come to some agreement with the church whereby religious services may be resumed, the possibility of a return to normal conditions is very remote. Close quote exterminate the marauding bands of Cristeros. I guess he meant it. After all, as we just heard, thanks to his good offices, the Mexican Gaius government was able to purchase directly from our arsenals 10,000 Enfield rifles, 10 million rounds of ammunition, and even get aircraft with American pilots. In Mexico City... On July 21st, 1929, the seat of negotiations orchestrated by Mr. Morrow between the Mexican government and the Vatican resulted in an accord. On June 21st, the Mexican Episcopate, except for one of its members, His Excellency Jose de Jesus Manriquez, signed a resolution of the conflict. The accord provided for, number one, immediate, unconditional ceasefire, and number two, the resumption of public worship beginning the next day, June 22nd. On their side, the bishops agreed to the resumption of public worship. On its side, now listen to this, the government agreed, though only verbally, that the Constitution of 1917, the supreme law of the land, would stand. But its anti-Catholic provisions would no longer be enforced. That is what the government promised, verbally. That was it. That was all. In other words, the peace agreement restored the Catholics to the precise and exact legal situation they had when they began in 1926 with all the anti-Catholic laws in effect, including the restoration of priests. Gary Potter comments, The Mexican bishops, even the ones sitting on the fence who were opposed to the armed rebellion, had seen value in the existence of the Cristeros, saw that they were useful. As Archbishop Ruiz y Flores wrote to a friend in February 1929, armed defense has had the glory of being a live and effective protest, of keeping the religious question alive, and of, we hope, obliging the government to look for a solution. Now the Cristeros were of no further use, and the bishops could not be more callous towards them. In the words of Archbishop Pascal Diaz to General Delgado in a meeting of the two men, Diaz had been named the, the Archbishop of Prime, Mexico City and Primate of the Nation as soon as the arrangements were, were signed. And these words, by the way, were recorded by the Secretary of the Archbishop, not General Delgado. These are the words of the Archbishop to General Delgado. Quote, I don't know, and I'm not interested in knowing in what condition you are going to be left. 
The only thing I must tell you is that you must lay down your arms. The banner for which you are fighting has ceased to exist now that the arrangements have been made. Close quote. General Jesus de Ogado, the Cristero, sent a last-minute desperate telegram to the Pope, quote, In grief we approach your holiness, humbly employing words, guide us, present situation, and not forget faithful sons. Close quote. The telegram was never answered. General Delgado then addressed his troops, his voice breaking from sorrow. His Holiness the Pope, by the intermediary of the most excellent apostolic nuncio, has decided for reasons which are unknown to us, but which as Catholics we accept, that public worship will be resumed tomorrow without the law being changed. This arrangement has wrested from us that which is most noble and most holy on our flag at the moment when the Church has declared that she will resign herself to what she's obtained. As for ourselves as men, we have a satisfaction that no one can take from us. The National Guard does not disappear, defeated by its enemies, but rather abandoned by the very ones who are to be the first to receive the fruit of our sacrifices and abnegation. Ave Christ, those who for you are going to humiliation, to exile, and perhaps to unglorious death, with the most fervent love salute you and once more proclaim you as king of our country. There seems to be no thought among the fighters to ignore or defy the order. As a document in the archives of one Jalisco parish testifies, they complied, quote, with the promptitude of an angel and the simplicity of a child, close quote. What was the cost to them of their obedience? On July 3rd, less than two weeks, after the agreements were signed, General Pedroza was shot by a government firing squad. He is simply the first of 5,000 Cristeros hunted down and murdered by the government in the next few years. With a handful of exceptions, no officers from general down to lieutenant would survive, apart from those who managed to flee into the United States. Christopher Check reports that the Cristeros, who were not willing to move out of their states, were taken prisoner and executed. The annihilation of Catholic militants after the 1929 agreement lasted for several years. There were mass executions in Jalisco, and reports of Cristero veterans being hunted down and killed lasted until the 1950s. It is not known how many thousands of them lost their lives after the war had been declared over. And it's clear that the Gar agreements didn't protect the clergy either. It is 1932 encyclical on the persecution of the Church in Mexico Pope Pius XI explains his reasoning over the surrender and sorrow at the results. Obviously, these are just excerpts. The whole encyclical is definitely worth reading, as well as his 20, 1926 encyclical on the same topic. Pius XI, quote, In the face of the firm and generous resistance of the oppressed, the government now began to give indications in various ways that would not be averse to coming to an agreement. Whereupon, though taught by painful experience to put scant trust in such promises, we felt obliged to ask ourselves whether it was for the good of souls to prolong the suspension of public worship. Of even greater weight was the consideration that suspension, according to grave reports which we had received from various and unexceptionable sources, was productive of serious harm to the faithful. We thought it best, having no other intention but the good of souls, to profit by the occasion which seemed to offer a possibility of having the rights of the hierarchy duly recognized. Unfortunately, as all know, our wishes and desires were not followed by the peace and favorable settlement for which we had hoped. On the contrary, to bishops, priests, and faithful Catholics continued to be penalized and imprisoned. Now, in 1932, in the state of Michoacan, one priest was assigned for every 33,000 of the faithful. In the state of Chiapas, one for every 60,000. Well, in the state of Veracruz, only one priest was assigned to exercise the sacred ministry for every 100,000 of the inhabitants. Close quote. The Vicar of Christ. Where there were 4,500 priests serving the people before the Christiata, in 1934, there were only 334 priests licensed by the government to serve 15 million people. The rest have been eliminated by immigration, expulsion, and assassination. By 1935, 17 states had no priests at all. Emilio Gill, the hand-picked successor of Caius, a Freemason, 
was president in 1929 when the war ended. At a banquet celebrating the summer solstice, right as the agreements were being agreed upon, Gill acknowledged his astonishment, his absolute astonishment, at the unconditional surrender of a victorious army. And at the same time, he announced his intention to continue the fight. Quote, The fight did not begin yesterday. The fight is eternal. The fight began centuries ago. Close quote. The fight did not begin yesterday. The fight is eternal. The fight did begin centuries ago. Viva Cristo Rey. Viva la Virgen de Guadalupe.